but symbolically in the United States. The symbolic effect for people living in low incomes in, say, rural areas of the United States of reading that Hillary Clinton went and talked to Goldman Sachs and she received $270,000 for one speech. And they kind of say, is that the kind of person who I think is going to work for me? Who is she going to work for? You know, she's not going to work it for me. And of course, uh, Donald Trump had in his hands the following argument. I made all of my money and I'm now going into politics using that money. Hillary Clinton went into politics to make money. And she's made a lot of money in politics. And that's all she's really about. And of course, everybody says, well, yeah. Yeah, of course. Why should, you know? So he says, trust me, because I'm using all of my money for political purposes on your behalf. <laughs> Don't trust her, because she's going to use her politi political position to make money, which is what she's been doing all along. So the Clintons are some of the richest people in the United States, and they've made it all out of politics. So, so when they make that argument, you know, pop, at a popular level, you know, sitting in the bar, what do people say to each other, you know, in those sort of rural areas? They just kind of say, oh, I don't trust that woman. I mean, why, why would I? I mean, she's, you know. And, and this was obvious, by the way, all along. I mean, I always felt that that, that, that argument would be conclusive uh, in, in, in local political discussions uh, in many parts of uh, the country. And, of course, it was. Capitalism has always been about growth. And the rate of growth is compound. That is, it has this kind of exponential growth curves. And exponential growth curves have a habit of going along fairly slowly and they reach a reinflection point and then they go up and they go up and they go zoom. Just to give you an idea of what is happening at this inflection point right now, the one economy uh, since 2008 that has actually grown significantly and in many respects kept global capitalism stable was that of China. And the Chinese expansion occurred through a massive urbanization and infrastructure development project. Give you an idea of what this is about. Between 2011 and 2013, China consumed 45% more cement than the United States consumed in the whole of the last century. Okay. And if you've lived in the United States, you know we consumed a hell of a lot of cement. Okay. But the Chinese, in three years, consumed, you know, 50%, nearly 50% more cement than the United States used in a whole, for 100 years. Now, this then you say to yourself, how, you know, what, is that, what does that mean? But that is what the rate of expansion has to be about now in order to accommodate exponential growth. Now, Donald Trump is going to do one thing. I mean, nobody knows exactly what he's going to do, but I can guarantee he's going to do one thing. He is going to try and create a boom in the U.S. economy. He has to. He has to create jobs. He has to create decent paying jobs. He's going to do what China did in the next five years. And if he, because his, you know, everything about what he's doing rests on that he's going to provide an answer to everybody who's living under conditions of low wages. He's got to create a boom, an economic boom. Now, I ask you this. If in 30 years' time we think of a rate of expansion that from what, what happened to the United States uh, for one century happened in China in three years, and then you say, all right, what's it going to look like in 30 years' time? And you kind of say, we'll be up to here in, our, in, in cement. We'll be, God knows what, what, kind of, what kind of urban world we'll be living in, you know, if we have to expand at the kind of rate that the Chinese did. Now, obviously, it's not going to be quite like that, but my, the, my point is that we've reached an inflection point where the growth, curiously, has to, to, to stop. Now, I'm not uh, saying everywhere should stop growing, you know, because there's some parts of the world that obviously need growth. But do we need to copy what China did in the United States over the next four or five years? If we do, what will the consequences be for the globe, 
what will it be consequences be for the environment uh, what will the consequences be for, for you know socially and politically and geopolitically so I mean I think that there are some very very severe strains right now which we have to look at and think about and ironically the fact that global capitalism has not been growing very fast has uh, actually been good in, in a sense in relationship to this but what is clearly very bad is that because there's been no growth we get all of these social and political tensions which are now Iran and, and, and fighting going on you know and anti-immigrants and all this kind of stuff in other words we're not managing the transition to a zero growth economy in a, a sensible way because we cannot continue to grow at the path on the path that we have been on for the last 200 years in the history of capitalism so I'm kind of saying look there are very good reasons to be anti-capitalist right now um, there are very good reasons to think about the transition to a zero growth economy but if a zero growth economy is going to be characterized by the kinds of politics we're seeing right now it's going to be a disaster but we have to say we have to say explicitly to ourselves and to everybody else that we need to manage this transition to a zero growth economy and we need to do it in a way that is socially equitable I mean I think we have a, a bit of a choice right now I mean um, we can either go the sort of Trump path or actually the, the other person who was uh, answering to some of those questions was Bernie Sanders uh, and it's possible that in the United States that if the power of the Clinton faction within the Democratic Party is destroyed which is not by the way it's still very strong but if a Bernie Sanders faction can take over the party then it seems to me that there is a possibility of at least a sort of social democratic quasi socialist kind of approach to these questions can emerge as being dominant because I think that there's a lot of common sense in, 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 and a younger generation is not hostile in the United States to socialism at all most of the polls show that uh, anybody under 35 you know kind of says all oh, this anti-communism is rubbish or what does that come from that, you know the Soviet Union is long gone you know and so 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 you have a so, so you have a, a possibility of building something you're seeing the same thing in the, in Britain by the way I mean Jeremy Corbyn does not have the support of the Parliament of the the members of Parliament of the Labour members of Parliament um, he's, he's a minority <clears throat> but in the mass party as we see he has a tremendous support so the mass party is antagonistic to its representatives and until those representatives are thrown out and in effect you get a par uh, members of parliament who are going to represent the mass party but the mass party is building very fast uh, the membership of the Labour Party has increased more rapidly than, than in, in it, ever in its history. There are organisations emerging which are not in the Labour Party but which are, so, which are social move, movements which are close to the Labour Party like uh, Momentum for example is building uh, you know, a political force. So w we can see movements that way but we can also see movements towards this anti-immigrant uh, you know let's uh, be isolationist let's you know so so I don't know how it's going to work out but I mean it's clear which side I would I would want to support and be uh, and be on and the same thing I think applies to urban politics um, but one of the big things in urban politics is I think you probably I don't you know I don't know Bas I haven't been around Barcelona very much for the last you know 10 or 15 years but my impression is that my major cities now because of the processes I talked about earlier have become bastions of the ultra rich in some ways and to the degree that they have any kind of popular base it's very hard to put that popular base uh, together into a coherent urban strategy uh, to try to change the nature of uh, the urbanization process because for me well, the big problem of the urbanization process which goes back to some of what I was talking about about the cement kind of thing is that increasingly right now we're actually building cities for people to invest in we're not building cities for people to live in 
So, so somehow or other, you've got to stop. We've got to put a stop to this process of building, building cities for people to invest in uh, as opposed to building cities for people to live in. I mean, and that's, that's, that's one of the big challenges at, at this particular moment. But if we stop building cities for people to invest in, see what it does to the rate of growth. Because that's one of the big ways in which growth is being maintained right now is by building booms all over the place, which brings me back to why China consumed all that cement.